Welcome to the History Unplugged podcast, the unscripted show that celebrates unsung heroes, myth busts historical lies, and rediscovers the forgotten stories that changed our world. I'm your host, Scott Rank. On October 15, 1950, General Douglas MacArthur, who at the time was Supreme Commander of UN troops in Korea, convinced President Harry Truman that communist forces of Kim Il-sung would be utterly defeated by Thanksgiving. He said very confidently, as MacArthur often did, that the Chinese would never intervene in the war. But as he was speaking, 300,000 Red Chinese soldiers began to cross the Manchurian border secretly. Even though MacArthur and his staff took intelligence warnings as fiction, the 1st Marine Division began to move deeply into the snowy mountains of North Korea toward the trap that Mao had set for MacArthur along the frozen shores of the Chosin Reservoir. With these 20,000 Marines pinned down, what followed was one of the most harrowing operations in American military history. Trapped in the mountains with temperatures 20 degrees below zero, the Marines had to hold off a massive numerical disadvantage against Chinese soldiers and somehow evacuate a convoy 13 miles long of vehicles, even though there were almost no roads and all infrastructure like bridges was being blown up and they had to improvise rebuilding the infrastructure on the fly as they were being pinned down by enemy soldiers fighting battle constantly. Today I'm speaking with Hampton Sides, author of the new book On Desperate Ground, The Marines at the Reservoir, The Korean War's Greatest Battle. We talk about one of the most important battles in 20th century history, yet something that has been largely overlooked, even though this battle and the Korean War at large set the stage for really the geopolitical fate of the entire Pacific world for the 20th century and leading up into the 21st century. So I hope you enjoyed this discussion with Hampton Sides. First of all, before we get into this battle, which for many people, unless they've studied the Korean War, don't know much about, I have a question for you about the Korean War. Off the air, I was talking with you about how I get approached by so many book authors about World War II and the Holocaust, which by all means is important to understand. But it seems in perspective, the Korean War has been heavily overlooked. You're only the second guest I've had to talk about the Korean War. And even though our geopolitical focus is increasingly looking toward East Asia for our challenges in the future, and even though the Korean War did much to set the stage for where the United States is now in relations to events in East Asia, the Korean War seems to be heavily overlooked. And I'm wondering why do you think this is? Do you think this is fair or unfair? Oh, yeah, I think it's tremendously unfair, not only to these men who fought in it, but to really kind of does a disservice to history because, you know, it was such an important uh, war in, in so many ways in our modern world. And in also in terms of, you know, the great ideological battle that was being fought during the Cold War with the Russians and, and to a lesser extent uh, with the Chinese. <clears throat> so, it's, you know, it's, it's a very, um, you know, it, it is an overlooked war, and uh, I've certainly done a little thinking on why that may be. Uh, I think it, it's a lot of little reasons, one of them being that Truman himself, President Truman, called it uh, a U.N. police action. And the nomenclature of that war kind of proceeded from that, that it wasn't really a war, that it was uh, somehow a limited war or um, – a war, uh, uh, some sort of proxy war, perhaps it was a civil war that we just kind of glommed on to. Um, but, uh, you know, these diminutives like this action or conflict kind of uh, take away the power uh, and the drama and, the, and the, the huge stakes that were involved in this battle. And I've really come to, to think of, of the Korean War as a world war that was fought in a very limited piece of geography, um, testing the waters for this larger conflict that was going on uh, between Stalin and Mao and, and, and Truman uh, to, to figure out and wrestle with the, the bigger idea of, of what's, what was the future you know, post-World War II world going to look like. Right. There's a lot of moving parts here. And yeah. as we enter into this, your book focuses specifically on the Chosin Reservoir and the battle that takes place there. But let's set the stage with 1950. What are the events leading up to this that we should be aware of? And what are people on the ground thinking? Are they assuming, like generals in the beginning of the Civil War, that this is a, 
inevitable conflict that will be over soon, or are they digging in their heels for a long war? What do they see at this point? Well, I think the United States was grossly un- unprepared for what became the Korean War, you know, the, the uh, surprise um, incursion from the north by Kim Il-sung and his army, his Soviet-trained, Soviet-equipped army. Uh, <clears throat> we didn't seem to see it coming, even though there was ample intelligence that something was brewing. Um, so, you know, some of the, just to sort of set the geopolitical stage, uh, there, you know, Mao had recently won his civil war against the national force, nationalist forces of China and Kai-shek. China and Kai-shek had decamped to Taiwan, um, and, uh, China was really trying to figure out how to, to, uh, stage a, a massive amphibious invasion of Taiwan and, and, and capture those last remaining forces. That's kind of what their focus was at the, at the, on the eve of the Korean war. Meanwhile, Stalin was focused almost, you know, exclusively on Eastern Europe and trying to, uh, um, kind of went, went over that block of Eastern European countries in this ideological conflict that was going on between capitalism and, and communism, uh, you know, shortly after World War II. Um, the other factor in all this is MacArthur, General MacArthur, who was running the occupation of Japan uh, from Tokyo, and was actually, you know, for all the, his faults, and you, you, if you, those who those who've read my book know I am no fan of MacArthur, but he was actually quite good at this one job, uh, running the occupation. I mean, he was essentially the emperor and trying to rewire that society. And, uh, I think he kind of viewed events in Korea as, as kind of an extension of, of, uh, the, the greater sphere of, in, of, of influence, um, emanating from Japan. Um, we had not really done a very good job of articulating the extent to which we would, defend South Korea in the event of some kind of invasion from the north. Um, and we somehow didn't see it coming. Came across that border in June of 1950 with his army. They steamrolled right through South Korea. They took Seoul, the capital, in just a few days and uh, nearly, quite nearly took the entire peninsula um, before we kind of regrouped, got some troops in there. The UN reacted, got some troops in there and um, began to get a foothold in the south and began to plan for the, the massive Incheon invasion, which um, turned the war back around in, in, uh, in the Allies' favor. Before we get too far into the battle, I have a question for you as someone who has researched extensively on MacArthur, because I think he uh, benefits from this uh, the World War II halo and rebuilding Japan and the MacArthur plan and other things. But those who are a little bit more studied in military history recognize his numerous faults, and they love to point out this take on him uh, and his many flaws. Uh, So to set the stage on maybe how the United States is is not correctly estimating Chinese commitment to North Korea, how would you describe MacArthur's faults to someone who really only knows of him as this victorious figure in World War II and not much else? Yeah. Well, he is a larger than life character. Every, everything he did was, you know, grand and, and grandiose and um it was all about him. Um, they used to say he was in love with the vertical pronoun, uh you know, I shall return. Um <laughs> not seeming to recognize that there was an entire army and navy behind him. Um he was an I guy, not a we guy, not a collaborative guy at all. And he uh, was micro attentive to the nuances of of media. Um, and, you know, how he looked on camera. Uh, he was an actor in some ways. He was quite dramatic. Uh, he, was, he was brilliant, um, although usually the first to admit it. Um, you know, he was someone who uh, was w- deeply versed in, in uh, military history and kind of thought and carried himself like some great general from the distant past, maybe like Napoleon or something. And he spoke in terms of, you know, these grand maneuvers and smiting blows and anvils. And, you know, he, he was kind of like out of a page of history, not, a, not in some ways a modern general, although he, except for his understanding of, of media, he was very clear on kind of 
projecting his image in the world. Um, the biggest problem with MacArthur by this point is that he had surrounded himself with a, a bunch of yes men in Tokyo who did his bidding and, and told him what he wanted to hear so that his intelligence was limited. Um, he had a vision for what he thought the war was going to be, how it was going to end, and anything that uh, interfered with that vision, uh, he, he just didn't want to hear about it. And so this set the stage for this massive intelligence failure, um, one of the largest ones in American military history, in which 300,000 Chinese troops moved into Manchuria, moved across the Yalu River, moved into North Korea, and got into place around the Chosun Reservoir and other key strategic places in North Korea. And we somehow didn't know about it. Uh, and even when we began to know about it, um, we didn't act on it. And so I think that MacArthur, uh, you know, as, as you say, you know, he has this kind of halo over his head from World War II. We're looking at a very different MacArthur now. He's a little past his expiration date. He's trying to run a war from, from afar, truly the definition of an absentee general, because he, he's in Tokyo, and he likes his creature comforts there. He likes his world that he set up there in the capital and he never spent a single night on Korean soil during the entire Korean War. Um, so, you know, he had, he had, his, had his various generals and, and advisors telling him what was, was going on, but uh, there was a disconnect there, and it, it really affected all the decision-making that led up to this battle. That adds an interesting dimension to this of the – Marines succeeding despite their overall command structure, not because of it, which uh, is enormously challenging to add on to the conditions they're facing. Uh, but let's not jump ahead too far in the narrative. So what how does the how do the allies first get word of the 300,000 soldiers in the Red Army crossing the Manchurian border? And what are some of the initial reactions to this? Well, the first solid intelligence that came in was from some skirmishes, some battles, small battles that were encountered as the Marines pushed up into that mountainous country of North Korea around Chosun Reservoir. During these uh, small, smaller sized battles, uh, prisoners were captured and they were interrogated. And lo and behold, they were Chinese. They were Chinese regular army troops that Mao had sent down and uh, they were amazingly forthcoming. They would say, you know, we're here. We've been here for a month. We, we, there's more coming. There's hundreds of thousands of us. You know, we're from this unit. Uh, and, you know, it was pretty stunning intelligence that was sent up the chain of command to Tokyo. And MacArthur's intelligence uh, chief and his other high-ranking officers chose to to interpret this information in a completely different way. They said, oh, these are just some volunteers. Many of them are, are Koreans, you know, North Koreans who happen to live in Manchuria have come down. Um, they're like gorillas. They're, they're irregular. They're uh, rogue <laughs> forces. Anything but regular army signifying that Mao is here and is, is committed to defending uh, this part of North Korea. Um, so that's where the intelligence failure becomes an, a leadership failure for me, because, you know, it's like they willingly misinterpreted some cases, even, uh, doctored the evidence, uh, so that they could tell the, the joint chiefs of staff and president Truman back in Washington, there's nothing to worry here. You know, we're just going to keep marching. The Chinese are not going to enter the war. War is going to be over. And certainly by Christmas and, uh, just, you know, don't worry about it. We got this. Hmm. Uh, with the 20,000 soldiers in the 1st Marine Division, um, what leads them to confront the Red Army at first when they're getting this rose-colored view of what's actually happening on the ground from their command? Mm -hmm. The interesting thing about this battle is that you have a, a field general, the commander of the 1st Marine Division, um, beginning to see what's on the ground. You know, all these... Chinese troops surrounding him uh, in this impossible terrain as winter is setting in. And yet from the top, he's getting, as you say, this rosy picture. Like, don't worry about it. There's not a problem. There's not going to be a battle. 